Hello, and welcome to part two of this set of lectures on what is this thing called science. And basically what we're going to do in this kind of short lecture is take a look at what are uh, referred to as scientific revolutions. But uh, I want you to think about this as uh, kind of a way that we can demonstrate that uh, science is a process that is uh, kind of continually correcting itself. Uh, that it's you know, working out uh, hypotheses, it's working out explanations, uh, and it's constantly testing those explanations to find out, you know, what are the limitations um, overall in an effort to come up with even better, uh, kind of more accurate explanations about what's going on. And this isn't to imply that, you know, all of science, you know, is continually changing. It just means that, you know, until we have a really good explanation about the world around us, it, it's necessary for us to keep testing, to keep experimenting, to keep trying to learn uh, about the world in order to come up with that better explanation. <clears throat> so uh, in the scientific revolutions, and this was a, a book uh, written by Thomas Kuhn uh, in the early 1960s, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, it really emphasizes that the, the goal of science, uh, the goal of uh, the scientific way of thinking, uh, is to obtain better explanations. Uh, and the reason for that is that, uh, as we've got in the quote here, more than one theoretical construction can always be placed upon a given set uh, or given collection of data. Uh, what that means is that if, if you collect a set of observations, you can come up with more than one explanation for, for why they occurred. Uh, so what we do in science is uh, we test it, you know, we test each one of those explanations uh, to find out, you know, does it, you know, continue to hold up? Is it, you know, something that continues to, to explain what it is that we're seeing? Or are there limitations in it? And if there are limitations in it, what we're going to do is make some modifications, make some changes to our explanation, uh, and hopefully fine tune it so we have a better understanding going forward. Oops. I'm the wrong one. Uh, and what Kuhn talked about was uh, what he referred to as paradigm shifts. Paradigms are like a mindset. Uh, and basically what it uh, says is that in order to shift from one paradigm to a new paradigm, uh, or from one explanation to another explanation, uh, we have to undergo a couple of different things. We have to reevaluate our prior findings. We have to really reevaluate what is the, the information that we had before this and come up with a better explanation, a better construction that explains what we're observing now and continues to explain what we've seen in the past, uh, but hopefully more reliably predict what uh, our explanation is gonna be able to predict for the future. So we'll have more reliable predictions about future observations. Uh, and again, this is kind of theoretical, uh, so we're gonna try to you know, come up with a, a couple very specific examples to show you what I mean uh, by the, the process of science being self-correcting. Uh, self-correcting, and as the slide says, science is continually advancing. As these hypotheses are, are being tested, as our explanations, as our, our kind of rules, if you want to think about it, about the world around us, uh, are continually being tested, we're going to find out where they work and where they don't work. And where they don't work, we're going to end up refining our explanation, refining our hypothesis, so that they become continually better and better. Uh, and the hope is that by refining them, we're going to be able to apply them to a much broader set of situations to you know, kind of explain more things and come up with better or more accurate predictions going forward. And so I put uh, a block of marble uh, on the right hand side of this slide uh, as an example of what science is. When we start out with, with science, we're basically starting out with this kind of unfinished kind of rectangular, almost like a column of, of marble being present. <coughs> I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> so basically, in science, we start out with uh, this raw kind of column of marble. <clears throat> and what we do when we come up with hypotheses is we come up with an explanation. We test that explanation. We test the hypothesis. Uh, and if it works, we're going to test it again. If it doesn't work, we're going to refine it. Uh, and so like this uh, statue, uh, Unfinished Bound Slave by Michelangelo, we're basically chipping away at refining the explanation so that ultimately we're going to come up with a really good hypothesis, a really good explanation uh, that's going to be very accurate uh, and allow us to make very, very good predictions. And that's going to indicate when we have a 
relatively complete understanding of whatever it is that we're studying. And so, you know, this process of science is continually refining, like we're continually, uh, Michelangelo uh, was continuing to refine uh, in the sculpture and, and basically kind of discover uh, the, the object that's hidden in here. Like in science, we're trying to discover the hypothesis, which is going to give us an explanation uh, about the world around us. So, uh, so we're going to look at a couple different examples. Uh, basically, we're looking at order in the universe. Uh, so the, uh, the goal of man or humanity <coughs> throughout time has been to try to understand kind of what is going on in the world around us. And so even prehistoric man uh, was capable of making observations and thinking about what those observations could potentially mean. Uh, so you, you know, like we talked about in the previous lecture, you know, you got the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. We see that the, the sun moves kind of back and forth along the, the horizon, uh, where it rises and where it sets, uh, as well as in the sky, uh, depending upon what season we're at. And so we've got those things changing. You know, we look at the moon moving, the changes in the moon. If you're really observant, uh, you look up the stars at night, you can see changes uh, in the stars. <coughs> And so if we take a look at Stonehenge in, in England, uh, what we've got is this whole huge uh, series of, or huge set of stones within a series of rings. Uh, it's been estimated that it was built about 2800 BC. So basically uh, almost, uh, almost 5,000 years ago. Uh, and what they've got are gonna be these series of columns, uh, these rock columns with slabs across the top of them. Some of them uh, as large as 30 feet tall. So basically, you know, like five people stacked on top of one another uh, and, and weighing uh, about 100,000 pounds. And so, you know, in and of itself, these rocks are, are incredibly heavy, incredibly bulky and, and difficult to work with. Uh, but then, you know, geologists have taken a look at Stonehenge and what they were able to determine is that the rocks used in the construction of, of Stonehenge came from 20 miles away. <clears throat> okay, so this really indicates that Stonehenge, even though we don't quite understand what it was about and what it was for, was probably pretty important. You know, if you're going to take, you know, 100,000 pounds of rock uh, and move it 20 miles uh, when you don't have, you know, like big machinery and trucks and you know, highways to drag, you know, you're basically dragging it, moving it, you know, 20 miles with, without any machinery. That's a lot of effort. Uh, and chances are they wouldn't have done it if it wasn't important. Uh, and so we're still not quite sure exactly what Stonehenge is about, uh, but what they've been able to learn is that it acts, uh, at least as one function of Stonehenge, uh, it acts like a giant calendar. <clears throat> we can see uh, the sun rising uh, ultimately between uh, a set of these uh, pillars, these stone pillars, uh, at um, specific times of the year. Uh, and so that again, uh, says that they had a great understanding uh, of the, at least the way that the earth was moving uh, in relationship to the sun, uh, because they were able to take these incredibly large, incredibly bulky, incredibly heavily uh, rocks and put them in a position that 5,000 years later, uh, the sun, the sun, yeah, the sun, uh, the sun is still rising uh, in between the pillar, in between the pillars and the gap between this at specific points in the calendar. Uh, so again, it indicates, you know, they had a great understanding. We don't understand how they did it, uh, but they had a great understanding about how the calendar works and how things, uh, the earth and the sun um, move in relationship to one another, uh, especially kind of across seasons. <clears throat> More recently, uh, in an effort to understand or explain uh, how the universe is, is going to be organized, uh, we look at the work of Claudius Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemy uh, was a Greek astronomer who was born in Egypt uh, about 100 AD. You know, it's almost 2,000 years ago. And uh, Ptolemy uh, basically used mathematics, uh, used his, his study of the stars, uh, and tried to come up with an explanation uh, for what's occurring, you know, what's, what's going on uh, as the, the seasons are changing. Um, but they're changing in a way that's reproducible. So we see the same pattern occurring year after year after year. <clears throat> and so what a Ptolemy proposed was what's referred to as the Ptolemaic model of the universe. So basically Ptolemy, Ptolemaic, uh, put his name into it. 
uh, was this idea of a, a geocentric model. Uh, geocentric basically means that we're going to put the Earth at the center, uh, the Earth at the center here on the right-hand portion of the slide, uh, and the planets and the sun are going to orbit around the Earth. Uh, so they're going to be in relatively circular orbits, uh, kind of going around it. So we can see the planets that are moving. You know, we see the moon here. We see some planets moving around. Uh, we see the sun uh, kind of moving around. And his model of the universe <clears throat> was a good scientific explanation for that period of time. Uh, they were able to use that Ptolemaic model uh, and uh, explain planetary movements, you know, the movement of Venus in the sky. Uh, we could use it to explain eclipses, um, you know, basically when the moon uh, is moving in front of the sun uh, or the earth is moving between the sun uh, and the moon uh, and we see eclipses occurring. Uh, so it worked pretty well uh, and it lasted about 1500 years. Uh, and again, this is a geocentric uh, model. So the Earth is at the center of this. <clears throat> About 1,500 years later, uh, a Polish cleric uh, by the name of Nicholas Copernicus uh, looked at the data, uh, looked at his observations, again, applied mathematics to it, uh, and came up with a slightly different version. Uh, Ptolemy's version was referred to as geocentric, geo because Earth is at the center. Uh, Copernicus came up with a heliocentric, Helio for sun. So heliocentric, the sun uh, at the center, not necessarily of the universe, but uh, at the center uh, of our solar system. Now he kept a lot of the things that were in the Ptolemaic theory. And so you got relatively circular orbits. Where, so instead of, you know, planets and the moon and all that stuff circulating around uh, the earth in these circular orbits, uh, we've got the sun at the center and earth, like the other planets, uh, is going to be moving around this relatively circular orbit. Uh, and the moon itself is, is going to be in a circular orbit uh, around the Earth. And so, uh, somewhat similar uh, to Ptolemy, uh, but big difference because instead of Earth being at the center, we've got Sun being the center. Uh, but it allowed for the same type of kind of explanation for past phenomena, and we could use it for predictions uh, about what's going to be occurring in the, for in the future. Now, it's important to recognize that the instruments of the time, so the, you know, the devices that they had, the, the, the uh, telescopes and ways of measuring you know, where the planets are and how they're moving and things like that, weren't accurate enough to measure the differences uh, between the Ptolemaic and the Copernican model. And so basically, uh, there were both possibilities for an explanation for what's going on and what we would refer to now uh, as our solar system. <clears throat> Soon after that, uh, we can take a look at the consequences of scientific revolution. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at a, a fairly serious um, kind of challenge to that, a challenge to the, the worldview at that point. Uh, so much so that, you know, it was a religious society at that time. Uh, the uh, Catholic Church was uh, very prominent uh, in uh, kind of the, uh, the leadership and the control of what was going on uh, during this period of time. Uh, and going against uh, the Catholic Church was viewed as heresy. Uh, and so we look at a, you know, two examples of this. Uh, Galileo Galilei and Giordano Bruno uh, were both uh, astronomers and philosophers uh, from Italy who uh, adopted uh, the Copernican model of the universe uh, as an explanation for what's going on uh, within our solar system. Um, but again, there were, there were challenges that, you know, people didn't like this change uh, to the model. They liked the, the earth being at the center uh, because potentially, you know, man is going to be kind of important if, you know, everything in the universe is, is revolving around us and our planet. Now, Galileo uh, was, uh, you know, connected. He had, you know, you know, good friends in high places. And so, you know, for him to do this, uh, he basically got sentenced to uh, life in seclusion. So he had to kind of go off and, you know, shelter in place almost as if it were um, to you know avoid spreading this heresy. Giordano Bruno though uh, wasn't as lucky. He uh, he wasn't as connected. He didn't have as many friends in high places uh, and he was actually burned at the stake uh, for promoting the idea of the Copernican uh, model of the universe, the Copernican model of the solar system which had the sun rather than the earth uh, at the center of the universe, at least the center of the solar system. Um, so if we take a look at this, you know, why does it matter uh, whether or not uh, the, the sun's at the center or the earth is the center? Uh, and the reason for that is that 
uh, the Copernican view uh, really challenges the view of metaphysics. Uh, and in metaphysics, again, we're taking a look at religion and we're taking a look at uh, the presence and importance of God. Uh, so basically taking science and kind of melding it with religion. And as we've talked about, you know, it, it doesn't really work well that way uh, because uh, the science way of thinking about things is different from the religious way of thinking about things. Uh, and so because of that, the uh, epistemology versus the metaphysics uh, is coming into challenge with one another. And so at that period of time, what we're looking at is that if the Copernican model is true, if the sun is at the center of the universe instead of the earth, uh, the world in the universe doesn't revolve around man. You know, it's not orbiting around man. Uh, and so maybe, you know, because of that, man's not as unique or as special as we thought. Uh, because, you know, not everything in the universe is revolving around us and the planet that we're on. Uh, and if man's not so important, you know, man, you know, based on the, the religious tenets at that time, uh, man was, was, was made in the, the image of God. Uh, and so if man's not important and not as unique and not as special as, as originally thought, you know, what's that mean about the God that created the man? Uh, and so very, um, very prominently what we can see is a conflict that arose, a controversy that arose uh, between the religious view of the universe and uh, the Copernican, the scientific view of the universe. Uh, and because of that, what we ended up with then uh, is a challenge where there were basically, you know, like we can see in modern times, uh, this view um, that we've got to kind of ignore the science or set the science aside because we don't like what it means. We don't like what it's telling us. <clears throat> so if we take this a little bit further and say, okay, uh, we took a look at it uh, in relationship to metaphysics uh, and religion. What is the Copernican view of the matter of computer, uh, Copernican view of the universe matter in relationship to axiology. Remember, axiology is our, our value theory. Uh, and so is uh, the Copernican view of the universe, the, the sun at the center uh, of our solar system or the center of the universe, is it good, is it moral? You know, I'm not sure, I'm not even sure how to answer that question. Um, it's kind of good either way, you know, and I'm not sure where you know, the sun and the earth have a, an impact on morality. So it really doesn't say a whole lot about it. Uh, aesthetically, uh, is the scientific view of the universe beautiful? And, you know, maybe. Uh, it's kind of neat to, you know, go to the Smithsonian Museum uh, and take a look at some of these uh, old models uh, that were built, you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, which has the, the planets and, and their moons kind of orbiting around them in this mechanical device uh, that shows you the presence of the or the position uh, of the earth in relation to the sun uh, at various times throughout the years. So that's, you know, it's kind of, you know, I would say beautiful. It's, it's kind of interesting that they were able to model that and have it work and, and have it be reliable. Uh, so, you know, potentially it's beautiful, but really, you know, science and, and beauty don't necessarily go together uh, in a way that can be easily compared because, you know, again, like we talked about before, What's beautiful to one person, what's beautiful to me, is, is going to be very different than what's beautiful and, and meaningful to somebody else. Uh, and then we get to the, the social political aspects of it. Is it legal? Is the, the Copernican view that the sun is at the center of our solar system legal? Uh, and as what we can see, uh, it wasn't legal at the time. Uh, again, because of the Catholic Church, uh, where it's very prominent, uh, and they basically said, no, don't be heretical. Uh, don't, you know, talk against the religion and, and God and all that. You know, we're happy with, you know, the earth at the center. Uh, and therefore, you know, don't break the laws. Don't, you know, upset us uh, by giving us scientific facts that we're not ready to uh, accept and, and adopt. So again, uh, the challenges of, of science when you try to apply it to different mindsets, to different perspectives. <clears throat> Now, what we know now, um, the Copernican view matters for epistemology. Uh, it matters for this scientific realm uh, of thought that we're working with. Um, the Copernican view gives us these observations and a model that we can use to really test what's going on in the universe and even locally within our solar system. So that we can put up, you know, here's the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is actually getting kind of old now at this point. Uh, but we could put this telescope up into space and we could very accurately kind of look at 
you know, the stars and the other things, uh, the celestial bodies out there uh, within the universe without uh, the atmosphere causing distraction, causing, you know, disruption, interfering with the, the quality of the image. And so we're able to make very, very accurate uh, predictions uh, based on the Copernican model. Uh, and we're able to test those predictions using things like the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and they're supporting this view of the Copernican view of the universe, or at least the Copernican view uh, of our solar system. So again, this really emphasizes the fact that humanity is, has always made an effort to try to explain what is going on in the world around us, come up for an explanation for, you know, you know why things happen. Um, and sometimes our explanations are good, uh, and sometimes we need to refine them over time. And science is a way of refining our explanation so that we can get to a, a more complete understanding about what's going on. Uh, and by using that more complete understanding about what's going on, we can make accurate predictions about what's going to be occurring in the future and potentially apply that scientific information. So that's going to end up the, the series of lectures uh, for today. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, thank you and have a great day.